I love this series of Nehemiah. This has been such a, a phenomenal series that we're in. And this series, it just hits home with no matter where you are in your, your Christian walk or your Christian life. As you're turning in, in your Bibles to the book of Nehemiah, we're going to be going back to uh, chapter 4. Uh, anybody here last week, I left you hanging, and I told you, if you've ever felt attacked, we'll come back next week and we'll see what Nehemiah had. And I had some people after church said, how dare you leave us hanging like that? Well, uh, the best is always yet to come. Amen. So we're going to go to Nehemiah chapter 4. As you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. And as you're turning there, uh, this is something for my wife and I that uh, we want to say to this congregation. Thank you for pastor appreciation. Uh, October is a cool time when, when people just do what you guys have done. Uh, that meal last week, uh, we were not expecting that, but all those that were here, uh, you guys did a fantastic job. Uh, I'm not sure who the, the workhorse was behind that, but uh, I want to say thanks to those that did that. Uh, uh, all the cards, the gift cards, Texas Roadhouse, thank you, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, there you go. But uh, I want to thank you for the offering that you took up of just appreciation. And uh, you guys are absolutely incredible, and, and we love working with you. Yeah, that's for you. That's for you. So, uh, And I do want to say this. This is not to take away from anything else ever, but I wanted to repeat something that my wife said as we walked out of the back building last Sunday. And I think it's something to, to kind of remember. But she said, in 11 years of being the pastors of this church, uh, I know we've been loved and appreciated, but she said, I have never felt more loved and appreciated by the words and the hugs and the cards that these people have showed us this day. And so that was from my wife, and I want to say thank you guys. You guys are absolutely awesome. Amen? Amen. Lucy, I love you. Can I, can I just stop and just say that? It is so good to have you here. So, hey, uh. As we're in this series, Nehemiah is incredible because Nehemiah speaks into each and every one of our lives that it don't matter where you are or what you're trying to build, the principles that God lays out in the Word of God is the most valuable things that we can ever attach to our lives and to ourself. It is the principles of godly principles that's actually going to get us over that hump. It's going to get us through that thing that we're going to try to get through. It's going to get us going through the middle of the valley of the shadow of death, knowing that he's got our hand. But Nehemiah gives us the biblical principles that we need to be able to build or rebuild anything in our lives that has been destroyed. So as you sit here today, do not raise your hand to any of this, okay? I'm just going to ask you a question. If you're here today and your marriage is broken and you're wanting it to be restored, I'm going to give you the good, bad, and the ugly, okay? Are you ready for this? You are not going to fix that marriage on your own. Amen. Well, I'm sorry. That's just, that just pretty much life. Do you know why I know that? Because as humans, we blow it. We say dumb things. We do dumb things. You want that marriage to be fixed? It is on the biblical principles of what God has put in place that's going to fix that marriage. Do you want a relationship to be mended that is broken? We're probably not going to fix that on our own. But it is through what God wants to do in our life. It is through the Word of God. It is through His precepts. It is through the promises that He's given us. That the Bible, this book that we're supposed to read, is an instruction manual on how to do this thing. So if your relationship is broken and you're struggling, what do you do? You go to the Word of God for a resource. You go to the Word of God for direction, and you go to the Word of God for your source of strength. You're mentally wounded. Has your heart been broken? Are you, are you a little stressed out of your gourd? I used to say it all the time that, do you feel like a, a termite in a yo-yo? And my daughter kept saying, Dad, quit saying that. <laughs> but sometimes I think we do feel like a termite in a yo-yo, that it's just the same old thing over and over and over and sometimes we come out and we have words like this. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Yes, it's worth it. Because God didn't send Jesus to die on Calvary for us to be in misery. God sent Jesus to die on Calvary that we can walk in victory. There's an enemy that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. 
that God sent his son Jesus Christ to die on a cross so that we can have life and have it more abundantly. So Nehemiah gives us these principles. 9-11. I look over at here, you don't have a clue because you weren't there. Now it's history. You study it in school. But how many in here will tell me where you were during 9-11? I know exactly where I was. I know exactly what I was going through. I know exactly what, what was taking place at that moment. The phone call that I got from my wife that said I, a second plane just hit the second tower. And how we ran home to our TVs and we watched this. And those memories are there forever. You know, I can remember my dad sitting down talking to me. And uh, I was only two years old at the time. But he said, uh, he goes, I remember when Pearl Harbor was bombed and the devastation. And he said when Pearl Harbor was bar- bombed, what was that, in 63, I believe it was. He said when it was bombed, you know, they didn't have TVs. And Dad said, I remember all of us running in and sitting around the radio and listening to the news on the radio. And I remember asking Dad, and, and he, was, he was telling me, he said, there was panic, there was horror, there was nobody knew what was taking place. And Dad said, it's something that's burned in my mind forever. It's a memory that you don't get rid of. And, you know, down a little bit further, we, we remember, uh, there's many here that remember when President uh, Kennedy got shot, when he got assassinated, and, and, you know, what that does. Anytime anything like that happens, there's a target, and it's been put on the back of Americans, and, and we look at this, and, and it, it's, a, it's a deal of remembrance. We remember exactly where we were when that tragedy took place. We remember what's going on when that took place. And it's kind of, it's kind of, that whole 9-11 is burned in my memory forever. And it changed America. You will never go through the airport ever again the same way as you did before 9-11. We will never look at security the same way. We'll never look at things the same way. Why? Because there was an enemy that targeted, put its target. And because of that, There were things that had to be put in place so the enemy couldn't take us out completely. Nehemiah shows us principles of what do we do when the enemy comes against us? What do we do when the enemy uh, comes at us? What do we do when the enemy begins to destroy the things in our life? What we do is we take action. But too many times what we do is we take action and we leave God out. And we do, can, can I just say it? We do stupid things. And we leave God out. And then when we have really messed it up, when we have really goofed it up, when we have shot our mouth off, when we've done some of the dumbest things that you look back and you go, well, I can see other knuckleheads doing that, but not me. And then you end up being the same knucklehead that you talk about. And you look at it and you go, Now that I've destroyed everything and I've torn everything up, I better bring God back into the mix. Why don't we use God as a last resource? I didn't get near as many amens on that question, (laughs) did I? But there's so many times we just use God as a last resource. And and as Nehemiah has put in things in place, it's things that we look at that we go, these are the things that we need to put in place if if we're going to be able to come out on top. Things happen and attacks happen and people come a- a- against us. And I'm going to be the bearer of bad news all the way around today, okay? You're never going to stop the attack. Never going to stop the attack. Has anybody ever said, well, I didn't see that one coming? Anybody ever said that? Well, there's a lot of things that I don't see coming. But I know that God does. So whenever we're putting the things in place, you've got to understand something about attacks from the enemy. It attacks our mind. And when it attacks our mind, we're going to remember. I can tell you exactly what was taking place when those planes hit the the, the World Trade Center towers. I know exactly where I was. I know the the panic. I knew the fear. Do you realize that at 9-11... Every church in Amarillo was full of people that were panicked. Is the church open? We need to come pray. Is the church open? We had to open the church for people to come. We had to do a special 9-11 service at the church that I was at 
that, that I preached that afternoon just for people that were scared, that needed, they, they felt like there wasn't any hope. I can tell you, uh, it gets into our minds and we remember. But when you begin to remember the battle, does it make you bitter or does it make you better? See, whenever we act out in our flesh, it will make you bitter. But when we allow God to do something incredible off, it will, it's amazing how God will take the tragedies of the world and, the, and the, the, the dumb things and he'll make them good and he'll make us better. Not only does it affect our mind, it affects our hearts and our hearts are going to feel. Has anybody ever felt broken? Has anybody ever felt hurt? Has anybody ever got so depressed that you couldn't eat? I have. It doesn't look like it. <laughs> Hang on. Yeah, thank you, honey. <laughs> but our hearts are going to fill. Will it harden your heart, what you're going through and what you're doing? Or does the presence of God in your life soften your heart? So that when the enemy comes, you don't attack him with a bitter heart, but you know how to attack him with a heart that is full of love. Do you know your emotions will lie to you every day? Man, I tell you, if I, uh, if I uh, acted out on my emotions, it would be amazing what would happen in my life. We sometimes have to put the emotions on the back burner and let the Holy Spirit get on the front burner and let the Holy Spirit take charge because my emotions will probably get in the way and boy I've, I've learned something about my emotions it's got this little rudder it's called a tongue <laughs> and i tell you we can say the dumbest things when our emotions get in the way but this is what i've learned about my emotions my emotions will lie to me all the time all the time. Will you be ruled by your emotions or will you rule over your emotions? So how do we cope? How do we do this thing? How do we do this? If you've got your Bibles, I know you're at Nehemiah, but if you've got your Bibles and you're a, you're a Bible thumper, I don't have this on the screen for you, but you'll have to turn in 2 Corinthians 10.4. And in 2 Corinthians 10.4, it talks about weapons that... Uh, that we fight with and weapons that we use and the weapons that we go to war with. And, and when you think about the weapons of the warfare that, that it talks about in the Bible, can you imagine for a moment, not a gun <laughs> that you can shoot from a distance, not a cannon that you can shoot from a long ways away, and not a missile that you can fire from another country. But can you imagine going into battle with this type of a weapon face to face hand to hand it's combat it's war and the bible is very clear when it talks to us about our spiritual walk this isn't tiptoeing through the tulips it's not lollygagging it's not jump roping and it's not just singing praises all of the time now we want that don't we but when the Bible talks about our spiritual walk, it calls this a battle, a battle. It calls this a spiritual battle. It says this is a fight. And whenever you look at the book of Nehemiah and you look all through the Bible, the Bible shows us how to fight this fight effectively. How do we do this thing? Well, in 2 Corinthians, it says this, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Let me read it to you in the living Bible. I use God's mighty weapons, not the weapons of those made by men, but I use God's mighty weapons. How do we fight this battle and how do we do this effectively? I want resources up here today so you can understand that this is a fight. What are the tools that we're going to be fighting with? What are these things that we're going to be trusting God for? How do we fight this thing? Well, it says the weapons of our warfare are those not, they're, they're God's mighty weapons. They're not made by men. And what are they for? They're, they are for the knocking down of the devil's stronghold. 
Anybody got a stronghold on your marriage that's trying to take you out for the count? Anybody got a stronghold in your finances? Anybody got a stronghold in your life that you ever got addicted to something that has taken you in the wrong direction? Has anybody in here got a stronghold of bondage that you are absolutely chained to a thought, to a personality, to a way, to an attitude, to an anger, to a gossip, to a slander? You are attached to something, chained to something that you can't get away from? It is called spiritual warfare. Let me, let me say it in a different way so you can understand it. If you are struggling in these areas, it's satanic. It's a satanic attack. Did you just say that I was... filled with an evil spirit? Did, Pastor, did you just say I'm demon-possessed? Did you just say that there's a demonic oppression? Or, what I'm telling you is that there's a satanic oppression. There is a demonic work. There is, there is a fight and a battle going on that wants to take you out. So what does it say? It says the weapons of our warfare are not those made by man, but they're made by God. So what are they? Let's go to Galatians 5.22 just really quick. What are these weapons? How do I fight and how do I fight effectively? There are tools and there's an arsenal that we have and it is given to us, the, the very attributes of God. How does God conquer? How does God do? How does God live? He lives by the fruit of the Spirit. They are the attributes of God. They are the things that, that, that cause winning. They are the things that, that creates us to be steadfast, that we can be permanent. And whenever we begin to pray in the Spirit, and whenever we begin to walk in the Spirit, and whenever we begin to fight this battle spiritually, the weapons that God gives us, it is one of the most powerful weapons in the entire world. The very first one is this, love. Some of you are going, oh, I thought you was going to give me a, like a grenade. <laughs> I'd catch a grenade for you. I'll just sing to you if nothing else. Okay? But this, this, this battle, they're weapons. And it's love. It is joy. It is peace. It is patience. It is goodness, kindness, burnt. Did I leave patience out? It is, it's that one I deal with. Don't go through a drive-thru with me. Because every time, every time Shannon looks at me and she goes, honey, you need to work on your patience. I hate drive throughs but these battles, how do, how do we win? How do we win? How do we fight? Love. How do we fight? Joy. How do we fight? Peace. How do we fight? Patience. How do we fight? Goodness, kindness, patience, gentleness, self-control. How do we do this? There's weapons that we've got to learn to fight with. So Nehemiah has given us principles of how to do this because he understands this, and you don't have to turn here because if you've been in this church for any amount of time, I quote it 50 times all the time, and it's my favorite scripture in the entire Bible because it's where God slapped me, whop upside the head, say whop upside the head. They just, you know, sometimes God just needs to hit you, and it's John 10.10. 10. And what does this say? The thief's purpose is to what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I love it that God intervenes and he says, but my purpose is to give life. How do we do it? We fight. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self -care. We fight with the weapons that he's given us to fight with. Well, <laughs> anybody ever been accused of something? Anybody, just anybody ever been accused of something? Amen. Don't you hate it when people put words in your mouth? I love it when I get phone calls and somebody says, well, I heard you said this. And I go, really? Well, that's interesting. Because that really wasn't how that conversation went. I hate it when people turn me into the person that I am not. Don't you, don't you hate that? 
well, you said and you did. Really? Was you in that conversation? And there's this attack that comes. I hate it when people turn me into that person or not. So how do we fight? How do we fight? I'm going to give you some principles just really quick. When the enemy attacks, the Word of God is our God. When the enemy attacks, Jesus Christ has to be the standard that we look at. We have to. How do we fight? We fight Christ-like. How do we do? We do with grace. How do we conquer? With mercy. Well, those don't sound like good weapons. They worked for Jesus on Calvary, and Jesus kicked the enemy's tail with these weapons. So if they worked for Jesus, wouldn't they work for us? I promise I'll get to Nehemiah here in a minute. I promise. So how do we do this? There's principles in Matthew, and you can, you can write these down. You can, just, you can look later. But when is the enemy going to attack you? I'm going to give, I'm going to give you some, some, some tips to know when the enemy is going to attack you. The, number, the first one is this. Write this down. After a great spiritual experience. You have a great altar call, don't put your sword down. You let God do something incredible in your life, don't lay the weapon down. You get baptized and show everybody in the church that I'm a believer and now I'm believing in Jesus Christ and you have that great experience and you're stepping out and you're coming out. Guess what? The enemy now is going to come against you. And what happens is after a great spiritual experience, the enemy will always attack. We know this for a fact because of Matthew 3, 16, 17, and you can read on when Jesus was baptized, and then he comes up, it says that the Holy Spirit ascended on him like a dove, and then what happened? And then he was led into the Spirit and tempted by the enemy. Understand this, everything you go through, Jesus has already been there, seen it, done it, and he didn't even get a t-shirt to show that he was there, but he conquered it. Amen? The second thing is know this. When is the enemy going to attack? At the beginning of a new spiritual endeavor. Hey, I just turned my life over and I want to turn things around. You got to understand something. That's when the enemy will be there. It said that uh, in Matthew 4, 17, that after Satan attacked him, it was at that attack when he walked away from that attack that he began his spiritual ministry for the next three years. So understand, anytime you want to do something right and you want to have a new endeavor, the enemy's there. The third one is this. He attacks when the believers, that's you and me, we're talking to the believers in the house today, when you are physically vulnerable. In other words, when you're tired, when you're worn out, when you're stressed, when you've had a fight, when you're upset, when your mind is running, vain imaginations, when somebody has hurt you and you've been targeted, be very careful because when you're worn out and when you're burning the candle at both ends, that's when the enemy will come at you. It said in Matthew 4, 2 and 3 that, that he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and afterwards he was famished. And then what happened? Then when he was famished, the tempter came. The fourth one is this, and understand this, and this one is a huge one. I preach it all the time. The enemy will attack when the believer is alone. He wants to single you out. He wants to take you away from those that love you, from a church that loves you. He wants to take you away from the fold. He wants you to take you away. He wants you to get you isolated. He wants to get you to where you insulate your heart that nobody's ever going to get in to hurt this thing again. He wants to isolate you and insulate you. And if he can get the believer alone, he wants to isolate you. And we see that in Matthew 4, 1, that Jesus was isolated and he was alone in the wilderness. But where was his strength? He wasn't alone. It was with God. It was with God. The fifth one is this. The attack will always come from unexpected sources. Isn't that funny? That the attack always happens from those you love the most. He sat right there with his disciples and he explained everything. And then when he got to the crucial moment, Peter went, no, 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 I rebuke you, Jesus. No, 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 dude, you ain't going to the cross, Jesus. I ain't going to let you do that. And what did Jesus do? Jesus looked at him and go, 
You're my own inner circle. You're, you're the one that just said who I was. What are you doing? Ready, fire, aim, Peter. What are you doing, Peter? And what did he do? He addressed this satanic attack that was coming at him. He didn't call Peter Satan, but I believe he looked through Peter. He looked through the problem at the source of the problem, and he said, he didn't say, Peter, get behind me. He said, Satan, get behind me. He looked through the person, but this is what always happens. The people that you love the most will end up hurting you the most. And then number six is an interesting one. An interesting one. How does the enemy attack? He always come back. He will always come back and attack again and again and again and again. And again, the enemy is relentless. It says in Luke 4.13 that after the devil had finished every test that he departed from Jesus until an opportune time to come back again. Isn't that interesting? So do you ever feel like you've got a target on your back that you've been uh, targeted and you've been misunderstood? Nehemiah understood. Nehemiah just answered the call. He answered the call to go and to work, to do what God had called him to do. He went to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, the Jewish people had been taken all the way across the desert, desert, 800 miles across the desert. And when God opened the door for them to came back, they came back, they rebuilt the temple, but they couldn't get the walls of protection rebuilt. And because of the reason why uh, that was, was because there was an outside force that was constantly coming at them and they were beginning to operate in some fear. Understand what I'm saying? They were beginning to operate in some fear. And they could not get the walls done. So for about 90 years, they fought this. For about 90 years, they let the enemy attack them. For about 90 years, they heard the taunting. Does it kind of remind you of the story when David went to the battlefield to take some food to his brothers? And he hears this giant making fun of God's people. And he goes, how long have you been listening to him? Does anybody remember how long it was? 40 days? And he goes, how long, how long, how long are you going to put up with this? How long are we going to put up with it? For 90 years, they couldn't get the walls built. For 90 years, they fought this thing. And Nehemiah, I'm going to tell you the end of the story, spoiler alert. Nehemiah did in 52 days. Because of biblical principles, he did in 52 days by precepts and concepts that were given by God, he did in 52 days what could not be accomplished in 90 years. So I want to talk to anybody here that's battling. Anybody that's battling. You've got something that you've battled for a very long time and you feel like you can't get away from it. You've battled it. And it's an ongoing thing over and over and over. Nehemiah shows us exactly how to do it. And we're going we're gonna to discuss it really quick. The very first thing, if you go back to my first sermon, he prays. Before he did anything else, he sought God. And there were four things. Write these down just so you'll know it. He prayed with reverence. He honored God when he started his prayer. He didn't start with a bag. He didn't start with a fear of wine. He started with reverence. He honored God. Then he repented for the sins of himself and the sins of the people that he didn't even know, for the sins of his forefathers and for everything that had gone before him. And then he remembered, God, you did it once, you can do it again. He remembered, and then he gave God his request. That's how we pray. That's how we do this. So let's go to Nehemiah 4. And as we go back, last week we ended with the attack. Nehemiah is building a wall. There's incredible things that's taking place. They're, they're doing an incredible work. But there's an opposition that's got a target on the back of every one of them and got a target on the back of Nehemiah himself. And in Nehemiah, and in Nehemiah 4, 7, we're going to look at 7 through 20. And it says in verse 7, but when Sanballat, can you say Sanballat? Sanballat. That's your friend that's shooting arrows. When Sanballat. But he just didn't do it alone. He got on the phone. He twittered. He got on Facebook. And he, he tried to see how many people he could pull in with him. 
and when Sanballat, and he got Tobiah with him, and the Arabs, and the Amorites, and then he got the people of Ashad, heard that the repairs of Jerusalem had gone ahead, and the gaps were being closed, they became very angry. Understand this. When your marriage is doing good, there is a hell that's going to get angry because God is doing something great. And understand this. Anytime your marriage is doing good, there's an enemy that's going to attack your marriage. And how's he going to do it? He's going to attack your marriage through you too. Remember the story of the king and the queen that I preached? The king can't do it without the queen, and the queen can't do it without the king. And so what does God honor? God honors the relationship that works together. It's, it's a mutual thing. You have to understand that as Nehemiah, we talked about it last week, as Nehemiah is building this wall, 22 times he mentioned next to him, next to him. Who's doing ministry with me full time in this church? I cannot do this without our youth pastors. Cannot do it. Why? Because we're doing ministry next to each other. I can't do this without Danny and Angelina next to me. I can't do this without Tabitha and Hamid and Layla that take care of our kids. I'll throw you in there because you're next to her, dude. Next to her. I can't, I can't do this. How do I do this? I do it with a praise team that is next to me. How do we conquer the enemy? Side by side. Uh, we, we go into battle together. 22 times it was, it was said next to him. So how do we do this? It's, it's the, these people were attacking and they were mad because the gaps in the walls were being closed and things were beginning to happen. So how do we do this? Well, why don't you jump, stick your finger there, Nehemiah, and why don't you jump over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 with me? Because it gives us a little bit of an example of what we're talking about. And the heading in your Bible is misleading on the way that I'm going to take it today. Because it says, dealing with a case of incest, we're talking about a sin issue that was inside of the church, not outside of the church, but a sin issue that was in the church. I'm not really worried that much about the enemy on the outside that's going to come in here to destroy me because I know the enemy on the outside has already been defeated by what Jesus Christ did on the cross. But what I am worried about is the people inside the fellowship that are wolves, wolves in or what is it? Sheep and wolf's clothes. Or wolf's and, yeah, sheep. Yeah, wolf's and sheep's clothing. That's, that's what I'm afraid of. Those that want to walk in from the outside and bring something from the outside into the inside that should not be here. How do you deal with sin inside of your church? Nehemiah shows us, but the Word of God gives us direction. How do we do this? It says this in verse, looking at, at chapter 5. It is actually reporting that there is sexual immorality among you of all kinds that even the pagans do not tolerate. Do you hear what he's saying? Do you hear what the writer is saying? He's telling the church there is a sin issue inside your buildings that the heathens on the outside don't even do. They would condemn what you're doing inside of the church and you're justifying it by your own wants and your own desires and your own, the words that are coming out of your mouth, you're justifying bringing a sin inside. This one is a man that's sleeping with his, with his father's wife. And he says, and you're proud about it, but we're not going to talk about that. We're going to go down a little further. But down further in verse 3, it says that the Apostle Paul has already passed judgment in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ on one who's doing this. What gave the Apostle Paul to cast judgment on him because he is their spiritual authority and their leader. You know, it says in Psalm 105, 15, it says, don't touch my anointed ones. That's scriptural. Don't touch the anointed ones. 
don't bring your sin inside and then point a finger of accusation of those that are doing what God has called them to do and justify your gossip and justify your slander and justify your words according to how you want to interpret things. Not even the pagans on the outside who have no belief in God will do the things that some people will walk into the church and try to justify. And the Word of God says, don't touch the anointed ones. Am I talking about me? Yes, and every other person that stands on this stage, and Danny, and Angelina, and you, as a witness to a world, you're the anointed of God. Don't let people bend you with gossip and slander. Don't let people bend your ear because you are the anointed of God. And if you go further into Psalms, those who touch the anointing, I don't care how you want to justify it and I don't care how you want to dress it up. I told you the other day, you can put lipstick on a pig and it's still a pig. But you can dress it up in so many ways. But when you come against the anointing of God, understand this. Understand this. You will pay. Not by me. Not by me. I am operating in love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. I'm trying my hardest to keep this right because I answer to God for this. But when you touch the anointing of God, if you come against what God is trying to do, you will pay. You will pay for what you're doing. And it will come in a lot of different directions. So let's go back to, to, to where we we're at in, in Corinthians, just really quick, to this sin. Verse 4 says, So when you are assembled, and I'm with you, I'm, I'm there in spirit, and the power of the Lord Jesus is present. This is what he says about those that want to live in sin. Hand this man over to Satan. That don't sound very godly, does it? Hand this person over to Satan. In other words, don't fight the fight that they want to fight. If they want to gossip and slander, if they want to split, if they want to do dumb things, if they want to target the mission of the church and the things of God, let them target it. Be bigger. Rise above it. Be bigger than they are and just honor God with your calling. God will take care of them. Honor God with your calling. And it goes on down. It says, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may have a new unleavened batch. It's called spiritual pruning. Sometimes it's got to take place. And then it goes down in verse 8. It says, Therefore, let us keep with the festival, not with the old bread, unleavened, which is malice and wickedness, but with unleavened, which is sincerity and truth. doesn't preach well, does it? It doesn't preach well. It's not kind sounding, is it? But it's spiritual, spiritual pruning. So what are we talking about? This is what we're talking about. In verse 10, he says this, I wrote to you in a letter not to associate with sexual immorality and immoral people. That's all, folks. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexual immoral, immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or greedy or swindlers or idolaters. In that case, if you weren't going to, you just had to leave the world all along. But in verse 11, he says this. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone. This is the word of God. Listen to what it says. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or a sister. We're talking to the church. We're not talking to outsiders. We're talking to the church. Don't associate with anybody who claims to be a brother and a sister, but is sexually immoral, or who is greedy, who is an idolater, or is a slanderer. Do you know what it means to slander? It means to drag someone's name through the mud. 
And it says this. Those people that act like that, this is the word of God. This is not Ronnie. Don't even sit with such people. So what do we do? How do we do this? I'm going to put a picture up on the screen. Anytime we're targeted, we've got to have a target. So you've got to understand that when we're targeted, we've got to have a target. What is the target? I want you to look at this target, and we're going to go from the middle out just really quick. What is the target? Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. We've got to learn how to fight this battle right. How are we going to do this? We're going to do this godly. How are we going to do this? We're going to do this right. How are we going to do this? We're not going to talk. We're, how are we going to do this? We're going to get on our knees and we're going to pray. We're going to battle. We're going to fight. We're going to do what Nehemiah did, and we're going to conquer something in 52 days that hasn't been able to be done in a very long time. Why? Because we're letting God have control, and we're getting ourselves out of the way. So whenever we have a target on our back or on our front, and somebody is targeting us. Remember, anytime there's a target, we have to make a target. So I want you to look at the target, and we're going to go out. The very first thing in the center of the target that you have to aim for if you want to fix anything is this, he. We've got to work on he. The first thing is he. How do we work on he? What is the he? The he is God. God has to be your priority target. Number one, he. Uh, what am I going to shoot for? I shoot for God. Well, what do I do with everybody else? Leave it alone. Walk away from it. Don't argue. Don't fight the case. Don't, don't stoop to other people's stupidity. But target God with everything that you've got. How am I going to fight it? Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. It is the he. When I get the he right, the second thing that we do is we work on the me. The me is where I get me right. I don't fix a relationship. I don't fix a church. I don't fix a ministry. I don't fix anything until I let God get this right. It's got to be God first. Then it's got to be me second. I don't fix my wife. I don't fix my kids. I don't fix anybody. That is the job of the Holy Spirit. I get this right, and then I begin to work on this. But it goes, we go, it is the he, it is the me, and then it is the we. That is my inner circle of influence. That is my family. That is my wife. That is my husband. That is whoever it is that you're working with. It is your inner circle. It is your tightest, it is your tightest community. It is your accountability friends. It is your partners. It is the target. It is the he, the me, the way. Uh, the we, and then we begin to work on the they. Who is the they? The they is everybody that, is, that I can have any association with that is connected to you. That's the they. Jerema, you are going to talk to people all day long that I'll never talk to. But the sermons that I preach, you can touch the they through what is taking place here. That is what we do. We, we target. It is a target that it goes from the he, the me, the we, the they, and then it goes to the them. Who is the them? The them is the pressed down, shaken together, and running over influence of what God is doing here that is touching lives worldwide. It is going everywhere. Ronnie, what are you talking about? We talked about it in Acts 1.8, and Jesus gave a commandment. And this is what he said, and you shall receive power. It is a tool. It is a weapon that you, will, that you will fight with. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And it says that you will be my witness. Where are you going to be my witness? It is the he. You're going to be my witness personally. You. You are going to make the difference because, because you are targeting. You're getting this right. It is the he. It all starts with God, and then it moves to me. It is Jerusalem. It says, you're going to be my witness in Jerusalem. And the Jerusalem is your own backyard. That's your family. That is your sphere of influence. That is where you can make a difference. And then it says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. That, that Judea is the we. It is my circle of influence. It moves through Samaria. It is the they that we can all have a connection with. And through the connection, we are going to reach a world that is lost, that needs to know Christ, that the target becomes the them. It is the he, me, we, they, and them. Amen? You understand that? I like it too. So let's go back. Let's go back to Nehemiah. So how did Nehemiah do it when he was attacked by the outsiders? It says this, but we pray. Ah, there you go, but we pray. Then in verse 10, it says, but meanwhile, the people of Judea, their strength was wearing out. Danny, come here. They were getting tired, and they were working. Oh, we don't want that yet. We don't, they were working. 
And they were getting tired. So Danny, come on up here, and I need you to go to work. And they were working. And they were, they were doing a job, and they were, but they were getting tired. And there was outside of, uh, uh, people that were attacking the inside work. You're doing good. You act like you've done that before. <laughs> we're going to take up a carpet allowance after church to replace the carpet on the stage. And, and he, he, he was starting to get tired, but the outside is attacking. And so it said that, that they were attacking and the laborers were given out because there was so much rubble that they couldn't rebuild the walls. And there were enemies that were, that were coming against them. And it says that in verse 11, that the enemies were coming against them. And they started plotting rumors that they were going to kill them. Sometimes people say things, and I hear it through the grapevine, I go, well, what are they out to do? Are they just out to kill me? And all I'm doing is trying to honor God. And sometimes I can get fearful of what God has called me to do. But the laborers were getting tired. And then the people in the church begin to talk. In Jerusalem, in Judea, they begin to talk. Well, everywhere we turn, we're afraid that somebody is out to get us. We're afraid that somebody is going to kill us. So verse 13. So therefore I stationed some people behind the lowest point of the wall. Billy, come up here. Station some people behind the lowest point of the wall. So Danny, I've got you at this part of the wall. I've got you at this part of the wall. But there's some more gaps and there's an enemy. There's things going on. So Big Mike, I'm going to station you over here. You remember what we talked about last week? Next to them, there were people that were building the sheep gate. There were people that were building this gate and there were people that were doing this. And Nehemiah goes, I need to put strategic people in the right places to do the right things because there is an enemy that's coming against us. And what did they do? He said, I positioned people at the exposed places beside their families. This is your family. And he told them, he said, don't be afraid of them. Remember that the Lord is great. And what we're doing here this is what God is working on. He's working on families. He's working on sons. He's working on daughters. He's working on wives. He's working on homes. And when the enemy comes against, understand that we have to have a battle plan. We've got to put things in place. So in verse 17... In verse 17, it says, Those who carried materials did the work with one hand. So what are we doing? We're doing the work with one hand. We're doing the work with one hand. And what are we doing? Here's your dancing partner, Big Mike. <laughs> Not all tools look like weapons. Not all tools look like a shovel. But everything is useful when God gives you a talent. And it said, and what they do? They did the work with one hand. Rob, they did the work with one hand. <laughs> they did the work with one hand. And they did what? What does this say? And they held a weapon in the other hand. They did the work with one hand, and they held a weapon with the other hand. They did the work with one hand, and they held a weapon with the other hand. They did the work with one hand. Did the work with one hand. Come ride that little train that is coming down the tracks through the junction. They did the work with one hand. And I had a weapon with the other. Woo! Woo! Don't give up. Give it to me. Come on, guys. Give me a, Come on, let's go. Help me out here. Get your march on. There you go. And 
There's a battle cry that's about to take place. But I love this next part. Can y'all keep with me for just a little bit? Can you stay with me? I love this next part. It says, but the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. The man who sounded the trumpet. Do you know what a trumpet sound sounds like in battle? Give me a battle cry. The man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. What is the sound of a trumpet? The sound of the trumpet is used to break the silence of noise. Do you understand that? It breaks the noise and it brings the silence and it brings the warriors to an alert. Give them a trumpet. And you were beside me. Give them a trumpet call. Come over here. Give them a trumpet call. And the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. In verse 20, he said, And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, when, are you, are you grabbing this? When you hear the sound of the trumpet, verse 20 says this, join us there. Come down here. Give them a blast and give them a blast. Will you join me? Will you join me? Will you join me? Oh, you can get better than that. Will you join me? Yes. Will you join me? Will you join me in the battle? Will you join me in the battle? We've got a battle. We've got a weapon in one hand and we've got a tool in the other. Will you join me in this battle? Give them a battle cry. Give them a battle. Will you join me in this battle? We've got a weapon in one hand and we've got a tool in the other. Will you join me in this battle? We've got a weapon in one hand and we've got a tool in the other. We're going to worship. We're going to end with a worship. And as we worship, let your worship be a weapon. I'm going to leave these men up here because I want you to see them battling with a weapon in one hand and a tool in the other. How are we going to do this? How are we going to fight this? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are godly. And they're for the taking down of strongholds. How are we going to win? We're going to win when we learn to fight with love, with joy, with peace, with patience, with goodness, with kindness, with gentleness, and self-control. Danny, you need a microphone or are you good? You need another hand? I want y'all to worship just really quick. Worship. And if you've got something you're battling, I want you to give it to God. Give it to God. We're going to put a tool in one hand and we're going to put a weapon in the other. And you're not going into battle alone, but side by side.